Hey, what's going on, everyone? Welcome to another episode of About Abroad, where it's my job to introduce you to people who have built amazing lives for themselves in various foreign corners of the globe. We're talking with expats and thought leaders about moving abroad, remote work, visas, and all the fun and practical knowledge that you need to know to follow in their footsteps. If you've ever dreamed of making a life for yourself overseas, maybe working remotely or embracing long-term travel, retiring or studying abroad, or even just taking a peek inside life beyond your borders, you've landed in the right place. My guest today is my new friend, Stephen, who is better known as the American in Paris. And I was really excited to finally get him on the show because a few weeks ago, we had Charles on about abroad to talk about his move to Brittany, France. And so many people wrote in saying, hey, I would love to follow in Charles's footsteps, but I don't know exactly how to do that. Could you get someone on the show that knows? Well, Stephen is exactly that. He's been living abroad in France for 10 years and is getting ready to get his French citizenship and passport and helps tons of people navigate the bureaucracy and immigration processes there in France. So if you're interested in moving to France, this one's for you. It's also for those of you who are just interested in talking a little bit more about living abroad and exploring global mobility because Stephen is certainly doing exactly that. This was a lot of fun. I learned a ton and I think you guys will as well. Please help me in welcoming the American in Paris, Stephen to About Abroad. So one of the interesting things I, I, I you could tease me about it. I, I've told my friends they can tease me about it. I'd always said when I moved to France, like the minute I'm eligible, like the clock, you know, counting down, you know, 58, 59, I'm going to go put in for my citizenship application. But the complacency sets in because residency delivers 99% of what citizenship does for people like, like me who have a class A passport, right? I have an American passport. So an EU passport gives me two or three other countries that I couldn't go to as an American, that, let, let, let's say North Korea, or um, one that I would be interested in going, for example, Syria. I'm quite interested in visiting Syria, but I couldn't go on my American passport without being interrogated when I go back to America, right? And I don't, I don't like three-hour interrogations, and I always feel like I'll say something wrong anyway, right? Like, uh, why are you people in the Middle East? Um, so, so, and I and I'm apolitical. The last time I I voted for anything was in a presidential primary in 2012. So getting getting French citizenship wasn't going to deliver anything tangible for my French life. Whereas if you're a South African, if you're a Brazilian, wow, an EU passport is a major upgrade. We're talking like 40 or 50 countries visa free suddenly get added to your life, and so they're waiting at the door to to get their citizenship. But I've been traveling a lot in the last year. And I thought, you know, I should probably put in my paperwork now. And so there's one last little piece of documentation that is finally getting to me from the French next month. I, I will pick up that documentation. And then two days later, I'm going to submit my, um, my citizenship dossier after I look it over with my lawyer. And then that'll be it. And, uh, and I'll have that done. But it really, it won't change anything other than it's a checkbox. And a, a a sort of testimony as to how much my outlook on Europe has changed from moving there 10 years ago and saying, oh, I'm going to get citizenship as soon as possible to 10 years pass. I've been eligible for five years already. And I think, oh, I should probably put that paperwork in. You know, <laughs> I've been eligible for years because you don't, you just forget about it. You think I don't really need French citizenship. Um, but you might as, I always tell people I'm very proactive. If people tell me they have access, like I was speaking to a vendor the other day, and she has Filipino ancestry. She's first, second generation in America. Her parents moved. And I said, so you're eligible for Filipino citizenship? She said, yes. I said, well, it's not a great passport, but I always tell people, if you're eligible for a passport, pick it up because you never know what options will be available for you in the future. And it's always better to have more options. There's, there's a saying in French, I'm sure it's the same in English, you know, it's better to have and not need than to need and not have, right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it makes a lot of sense, especially when we're talking about something as serious as a as a citizenship. And I, and I think that's like a a slight change in perspective that um, a lot of us coming from the Western world maybe before didn't really think about it in terms of like security. You know, like a like nice to have a second option. You know, like quote unquote just in case. Maybe we feel like that just in case is like a little bit more 
potentially imminent than than it was, you know, ten years ago or something. I'm not trying to be doomsday kind of guy, but right, right, or, or three or three years ago, right? Yeah, <laughs> but you feel that more, right? Like I hear people talking about a citizenship more as like, you know, I might, who knows, I might need this, and whereas before it would, it was like, I think like you, you know, when you came ten years ago, you're like, it's sort of like a. a a badge of honor or something where you're like, I'm going to get this citizenship as soon as I can. And, um, well, and to, and, and to the practical side of that was it would open up the door to me at that time to renounce U S citizenship. So that was very much on my mind. Uh, so I have a Georgian offshore company. I was going to go down that path of, okay, a more global life. That's harder to do with the U S citizenship because they want you, they want your money everywhere. The, the, the sort of joke that the country that was ostensibly folded, f- founded on a tax revolt taxes you even if you live on the moon, you know, uh, that that I I really had that in my mind because philosophically, you know, wh- how how can you have two passports? What if those two countries get in a war? Whose side are you going to fight on? But I think I, I had that perspective because I had to renounce my Singapore citizenship when I was very young. Singapore doesn't allow um, Singapore like Norway the Netherlands, Japan, a bunch of other countries don't allow dual nationality. And Singapore doesn't. They even held up my mother's passport renewal. They said, uh, hey, you know, your son hasn't got back to us about national service. You know, we need a formal yes or no from him. And if I said no, I had to renounce my citizenship. Now, I was 18 at the time. But I, I if I go back, I would still make the decision. I think I would have just thought about it for seven seconds longer, you know. But the idea that I would give up a U.S. citizenship become a green card holder, never be allowed to leave the U.S. for more than six months at a time. All of those changes to my life. And, and then to, to hold a Singapore passport, which, by the way, has recently been ranked as the most powerful passport in the world. But then I'm, I'm tied to a place that I hadn't lived in for nine years, and it just wasn't feasible. But I, I do understand for those people who've had to renounce, it's not an easy thing, but for me, with my situation and, and having an American passport, it was not a difficult decision. Isn't it wild how much, like like those of us that live in this world, because um, there's a whole lot of people that don't. Like there's a whole lot of people that just like born in their country and stay in their country and never even think about residency, citizenship, passports, uh, you know, the, the intricacies of paying taxes in other places like isn't it? And, and some of us have chosen this. Some of us were forced into it, um, you know, f- through a variety of different means. So everybody's coming from a different vantage point. But um, but there's like this is a whole nother language <laughs> for a lot of people. And and when you start living this lifestyle, it just becomes like second nature. Like, you'll, I'll be sitting at a, you know, a, a happy hour or something with people just chit chatting. And we're like, this is what we end up talking about. <laughs> it's like passports and citizenships and, you know, oh yeah, I got my visa renewal coming. Oh, is it the H1N1? Yeah. It's, it's, you're like, oh God, it, this is, this is what we talk about now. <laughs> I was, in, I was having drinks with some friends in, in Helsinki, you know, and it was, it was near midsummer. So, you know, it doesn't, the light, the, the light never, the sun doesn't really set. And there's this beautiful color in the sky. And a Swedish girl sits down at our table and we just get talking and uh, she is an accidental American. You know, this term where you're born and you get citizenship because you're there and, and America's aware of you. And uh, I said, have you been filing taxes? And she says, no, no, I, I don't think they're going to find me. I said, I said, um, America's doing pretty bad financially. The, the IRS is going to find you. You know, and it's like, and I, I tried to do the Liam Neeson voice, you know, like they will find you and they will tax you. Um, and, right. And, and I, you know, I said, you know, you should make sure that you're up to date. She's like, oh, I'm just, she, and she's keeping a W-2 form from, you know, 2008, which was the last time she was in America. She's like, I have this in case they come. I said, you think they care about some 2008 W-2 form? Um, and so a number of people, including Boris Johnson, have renounced because the tentacles came and said, hey, we want your money. And they said, uh, it's, American citizenship's not worth that to me, and I'm out. And I said, it's usually not worth it to smaller fish like ourselves. We don't have you know millions and millions of dollars of assets. So I said, just get compliant. There's amnesty if you fill it out. I know people who've helped. I know a guy who's helped people you know get compliant. But you, you always want to be in the situation where you've done the... You're, you've crossed your T's and you're dotted your I's as opposed to the IRS coming and saying, hey, yo, where's our tax returns from the last 20 years? 
uh, you don't want to be in that. The IRS, they're such a weaponized, they can draft your bank account. They're the only entity in the United States, I think, who can come in and just take money straight out of your bank account. And I tell people, I said, you don't really want to be in that situation. And the U.S. can freeze bank accounts around the world. It's just. It's a, the tentacles run, run far and wide, man. It's, uh, it's, it's not to be messed with, like do it, do it right. Uh, one of our sponsors on the show has been Greenback Tax, a uh, company that I've trusted with my expat taxes. So for this. So he does, he, he does all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the kind of thing you, you just want to like hire a professional and, and help yourself. Uh, <laughs> shout out to the sponsors. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> totally. Um, so, okay. I'm, I'm very, very curious. I have been dying to talk to you because, um, France is as far as I know, you can correct me if, if I'm wrong, but it's, I'm, I know I'm close at least it's the most uh, visited country in the world. It is extremely popular. Um, incredible amenities. I mean, when you think about it as a, a country, it has the French Alps, it's got the Mediterranean sea, it's got wine country. It's got one of the most famous cities in the world. Uh, before you get to many other things down the list, so it's a it's a popular place to say the to say the least. Um, however, I have always kind of had the impression that it's not a country like whereas there's others, let's say like Portugal, um, for example, uh, or or countries in Southeast Asia, which really thrive their economies thrive on bringing in outsiders uh, to come live there for medium to long periods of time as expats or nomads or whatever. Um, those countries seem hungry for that type of tourism. Uh, we'll call it tourism. And France does not to me. France has plenty of tourism as it is. The economy is strong. What, for whatever reason, it doesn't strike me as one of those countries that's like provides a path to moving from the outside looking in. And to shed a little bit more context on that, I, when I started looking into moving abroad, my desire was to get to Europe. I wanted to come spend some time, significant time in Europe. And so I started doing research on all the countries that I could move to in Europe. And I found my options were really limited and I never found a way into France. This was, we're talking seven years ago. So it's not like, Oh man, I wish I could have, I, I, I was around. I wish I could have helped you back then. My I wish I could have too. I wish you could have too. Now that I know your story a bit more, but so this is like all the backstory for why I'm so excited to talk to you because I I know a bit more about your story now. I've looked at you know your web page and I know what you got what you're doing a bit, but I've been holding off on diving too deep until we can we can have this conversation. So that's where I'm coming from. I would love to like hear a little bit about your story, like how you arrived to to France and and you know started this longer term journey there, and then we'll we'll see where it goes. Sure. So I, I was the same as you, but let's say 10 years ago, I was looking on the internet and had to figure, had to figure this out. But how do I get to figuring out about France? You have to go back to a tutoring company that I had been running for seven years. I was in Kansas City. And this was the sort of agency that helps you get ready for the ACT, SAT, GMAT, GRE, LSAT. I sold that company and then I spent a year figuring out how to come to France. And like you, Europe was on my mind. I had studied abroad as a sophomore in Rome, changed my life, was always on my mind. And I thought, if I don't go to Europe now, I'm not going to go, right? I just sold this company. It's a great time to go. And so how do I get to France as a non-student, non-au pair, uh, non-spouse, non-salaried worker? So those are your four easiest paths. So if any of the listeners are under the age of 26 and don't mind looking after kids, the au pair visa is one of the easiest visas you can get. If you want to study at all, if you want to, for example, get a master's degree, first of all, it's inexpensive to get a master's degree in France and be like maybe 500 bucks. And there's an accelerated path to citizenship if you if you want to become a student. So if you're not old like me and you, you want to go, I, I got an MBA, I don't want to ever do any more school. If you want to get a master's, there's an accelerated path to citizenship. It's a very easy visa to get. Then if you're a spouse or you're dating somebody, that's a quite easy visa to get. And then finally, if you have a job, if you are one of these people with a particular set of skills, such that a European company, a French company is willing to pay 10 grand to sponsor you and then pay 25% of your salary in tax forever, which that's why I always tell people, be realistic about your French job prospects. They're not realistic. So those are the four easiest paths because that company is going to take care of all your legal stuff and they'll then the one that's most open to you as someone casual is the visitor visa. That's what I came over on. 
So you just need to prove to the French that you have what is called the SMIC, which is a, an abbreviation that means the, the minimum wage for the country, which in France changes every year, but it's around 1300 euros. That's what there was a big news story recently when an iPhone came out and said, yeah, the iPhone is the same as the minimum wage for one month in, in France. Um, so it's just this status symbol. But that's all you have to prove to the French that you can make the minimum wage, which is 1300 euros a month. And there's an enormous debate online if you go. And I don't know why, because you, I don't know why people are so passionate about saying remote workers cannot come to France. But there is an uh, there's a group of people with no joy in their lives who go onto forums to tell you remote workers not welcome. Now, here's what you have to understand. So I'm I'm what is called a, a profession liberal, which is a different, the closest to analog would be an entrepreneur visa, a freelancer visa, if you want to call it that. Okay, it has a, it has a salary cap, which we can get to later. I didn't know about that visa. I was just how do I get to France? And this visitor visa said, hey, as long as you have this money, and they said whether you make this money or you have this money, it doesn't matter. You just need to show us that you have this money. The equivalent of 1300 a month, basically. Right. So I just had this sale. So I was able to show my happy bank account and just say, hey, look, my bank account's really happy. I can, I can live in France for a year. Stamp, stamp, approved. The visitor visa, if you think about each visa having one key piece of documentation that makes or breaks the visa, for a student visa, it's an enrollment. For an au pair visa, it's a contract with a family. Right. For a spousal visa, it's I have a marriage certificate or I have evidence that we're in a relationship heading towards marriage. For a, a, a visitor visa, it's a bank statement. And, and what's nice is if you are a younger person listening to this, you could also uh, if your, your parents are willing to add you as a signatory onto their 401k or their savings or their E-Trade account. That counts, too. The French don't care. You're asking for a license to come spend money in their country with them having no responsibilities for you. And if you, like me, have a dark blue passport, you have passport privilege, the French do not scrutinize our applications. It's stamp, stamp, and it's usually your passport goes away for eight days, it comes back with a sticker, you're good. So that's the visitor visa. I I would classify that for, I'd like to see what it's like to live in France. I'm not sure, okay? So that's good for one year. You can renew that four times before you're eligible to renew for a 10-year card, okay? But there's a language test attached to the 10-year card. But you're going to have to renew and you're going to need to be in France around that time every year for, for four years. So after four renewals, you'll be eligible for a 10-year card. The language level, for those who understand DELF levels, it goes A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2. C2 being really good, I can read technical French. A1 being I can greet you on the street, maybe, right? You need to pass an A2 test to get the 10-year card. You have to pass a B1 test for citizenship. So uh, if you don't know, if you're like Chase or, or even myself, you just came, I don't know how this French, French journey is going to go. I'm going to go for a year. The visitor visa is a very easy visa to get. It's going to take you all of 30 minutes to put that together. Really? Okay. That was good. So the two, two kind of like join follow-up questions is going to ask roughly like what's the... It almost sounds like so good to be true. I'm like, well, there has to be a catch. There must be this brutal process you have to go through. So you kind of just answered that. But I, my, the second part of my question is, is where do you do the application? Is it done in your home country? And or do you do, you it, do it? You, you do it. In, no, you do it in your country of residence. So I've helped Americans who've been resident in Japan apply and you apply in the language of your residence. So if you're in Japan, you're going to apply in Japanese. <laughs> if you're in America, you're going to apply in English. But when it comes time for your renewal, since you're a French resident, now you're going to renew in France and it, the, the renewal will be in French. So either get your French up to speed or bring a homie with you to your appointment to help out. And, and so you said, what's the catch? And I, I, I want to be crystal clear about this. You're going to be a fiscal resident of France. So as part of the renewal process, you're going to have to file taxes in France. France, as far as the United States goes, they have a tax treaty. As far as Singapore goes, they have a tax treaty, which means... You, you're going to get credit for taxes you've already paid, but it's not like a, a rebate or anything. But it makes your life a little bit more complicated. But we all know living abroad is a complicated life. It's not it's not straightforward. But how it looks for me every year is I file my U.S. business, U.S. personal, French business, French personal. So my my February, March, April and May are they have their own, you know, things that I have to focus on. And that happens every year. 
Um, that's what I, I think I was telling you before we started recording that I have a Georgian entity. What's really fun about Georgian businesses is they don't do an annual thing. You just file every month and you're compliant. So you don't have to have some horrible annual thing. And Georgia, Georgian businesses are only taxed if you pull profit out. If you're just if you're leaving it in there, you're you're acquiring assets with that with that entity, then then you're good. Uh, that's a that's a that's a different conversation, Georgia. I'll bring us back yeah. to France. <laughs> I'm very interested in that conversation, though. That's that's uh, that's fascinating. <laughs> oh, and Georgia's beautiful too. Uh, so the the visitor visa is for people who I want to give France a try. I'm not certain. Let me see how it fits. And then you're obliged to renew. You can't change visa statuses in your first year of visitor. There's there's not an explanation for why that is online, but I've run into numerous people who've tried to switch after their first year and they've been denied. So you have to renew at least one time. So if you if you go visitor, you're basically committing to that status for 24 months. So the heated debate online is, are you allowed to remote work? Well, the thing is I've helped so many people get visitor visas in which their proof of income was a letter from their employer saying, I will be paying Chase three grand a month. Don't worry about it. And the French read this. So then they're going to argue, well, that's fine. That's the immigration authority, but the tax authority doesn't agree. I said, well, that's fine. But the point is the French immigration authority allows remote workers. If there's not harmony between the laws, it's because things move slowly in France. The law that governs my visa classification, the profit, pro profession liberale, it dates back to the time of Louis XIV. Right. So the idea that there's a digital nomad visa coming for the French, it's not coming anytime sooner. If it is, it's going to come in 30 years. OK, things move slowly in France. That's part of why those of us who live there love it. But it also means that you have to look at other avenues to express what does that mean to be a digital nomad? Well, I could get a freelancer visa. Now, that's why I hesitate to say people should get that at first, because it's really a full commitment. It means I'm going to start a business in France. And there are, and now that means you enter the pension system, the healthcare system, all these other things, and you're paying in. And if it doesn't work out, you have to exit those systems. And that's a painful paperwork process. But what's nice about that, and the correspondent to the Profession Liberale visa is the Passport Talon, which has 11 subclassifications, including like a tech worker is classified under Talon. Uh, so you can come if you're a tech worker. That's a great visa to get. You want to open a bed and breakfast or buy some a real estate producing a real estate business that produces income. That's classified under Talon. But they also have correspondents that look like uh, Profession Liberal. What's nice about Talon, and for those of you who aren't French speakers, it's just talent <laughs> pronounced with the French pronunciation. I was envisioning so like the claws of a bird, Talon. And uh, but which is kind of like the French uh, tax authority. They're sort of gripping at your money with their talents. OK, now it makes sense. Yeah, so, something like that for sure. So the talent visa comes with a four year card off the bat, whereas my visa class classification, you get a one year card. And then at your renewal, if everything looks good for your business, they'll give you a four year card. And then that's eligible for another four year card. And for those of us in the visa world, anytime you get a multi year card, it's beautiful because you don't have to go to the immigration office yeah. for a number of years. You can't, you can't put a price on that. Yeah, it's priceless, right? And that's why that I tell people if you're, if you don't want to start a business in France, so this is when I talk to older people, Stephen, I'm 50, I don't really want to start a French business. How, how can I do this? And I say, go visitor and stay visitor, work on your French, improve, and then apply for a 10 year card. At the same time you apply for a 10-year card, you're going to be eligible for citizenship, potentially, right? So now there's a question there as to filing taxes and paying taxes, because there's a debate that if you're not actually paying taxes in France, this may hold up your citizenship application. I haven't yet heard of somebody who's gone for citizenship on the visitor path because they're not paying taxes. They're, usually they're just filing taxes and their income comes from another country that has a treaty with America. But just because I've never heard of someone doing it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. But I'm very keen. If someone who hears this, they got French citizenship by going the, v the visitor route for many years and then filing, I would love to, to meet you. But a lot of times I've met visitors, they've been in France 20 years. Not only do they not have a 10-year card because their French isn't good enough, which is shocking, but they, they don't have citizenship. So I'd hate to be going to the... I'd hate to be going to the 
immigration authorities every year for 20 years but you know that's not my life right? yeah so someone else wants to do it yeah that sounds so. miserable i threw a party when i finally got the permanent residency and said okay i don't have to do this for 10 years We'll be right back to the show after a quick break for a note from our sponsor. This episode is brought to you in partnership with my friends over at Kona. Those of you that have been listening to the show for a long time know that I am a huge fan of the remote work movement. However, I also recognize it comes with some challenges. One of those challenges that plagues many remote teams is employee burnout or employee dissatisfaction with their jobs. This is really hard to monitor as a leader when your teammates are not sitting face to face with you in an office anymore. But that's what Kona was built to tackle and they've done a phenomenal job. The co-founders over there are friends and people who have truly built something to help people and help remote workers more specifically. So I love what they're doing. It makes a huge impact for their customers and I'm excited to partner with them here. You can find out more and get 15% off your team subscription by going to the link in the show notes and using the code CHASE at checkout. Feel free to ask me any questions. I highly recommend this product and am excited to hear what the About Abroad community thinks. Check out the link in the show notes and use the code CHASE at checkout to get 15% off your subscription. If you've made it this far into the episode and you're still enjoying yourself, then I would love to ask a quick favor. Open up the app that you're using to listen to this podcast and leave a quick review. You can do this in Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and really just about any platform that allows podcast listening now. If you can't find that in the interface of the app, then scroll down in the show notes and find ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad, and you should be able to leave it from there. Thanks so much, guys. We really appreciate it and hope you enjoy the rest of the show. So, okay. So I w- I'm very curious about this then. It's, it's actually much less complicated than I would have imagined. And all these avenues are open and I'm going, why couldn't I find this information uh, years ago? So uh, I'm glad that you brought it to the surface. Be- because the French government isn't forthcoming. So part of how this all happened was when I was looking in 2012, there was not a lot of information online. There's a lot more information online now. So people are going to say, well, that's not true, Stephen. You're, you're right. It's not true now. But in 2012, good luck looking for how to get into France. And when I figured it out by piecing things together, I then said, well, as long as I'm doing this, I might as well take photos of everything and send the elevator down for somebody else. You know, And so I... I took photos of when I went to Chicago to the consulate for my interview. I was all dressed up in a suit. I thought they were really going to interview me. There's no interview, right? It's just a, it's just an appearance in person. They call it an interview, but there's no interview. I was ready. I was like practicing my French. I'm like, I'm going to bust out some French on them. And it was nothing. And I, I, I chronicled all this. Now, what then, and I put it on my blog, which I was going to use to chronicle my French journey. I had no idea of what it would become later. But then people started to message me and say, hey, Stephen, I printed out your article and I got my visa and I'd love to take you out for coffee when I'm in Paris. I was like, free coffee? Great. Um, then then someone emailed and said, hey, you know, I could use a little help. Could I pay you to to help with this? I was like, you want to pay me money? Yeah, sure. Um, and then I kept answering the same questions all the time. And all the smart people in my life said, Stephen, if you keep answering the same question, just make a course. So I did, I made a course, but I still, I still, a lot of people would still bypass the course and want private consultations, but I had a, basically an FAQ that I would go through each time and say, here are the things that you need to know. Let me talk for a while and then save your questions and I'll go through that. And that's, that's what the site developed into was a, not only how to live in France, like here's how a supermarket works. Here's how the bakeries work. Here's how the line works. You can order your baguette in different temperatures but also the here's how you deal with French immigration. And this is something that really terrified me early on because they have, they have they're legendary at how mean they can be. And what I try to give people context the very first time I talk to them about immigration to France and just say, listen, these people have a bureaucratic job. It's not an exciting job. They live for their coffee breaks, their cigarettes and conversations with friends. When you make when you complicate their day, you ruin this part of it. So if you come to them with your dossier, with everything they asked for, as well as a file of everything they didn't ask for, but they might ask for, and you hand it to them when they ask, you've made their day and they're going to be nice to you. If there is something missing that you were told to bring and you, whatever excuse you may have, you've ruined their day, you've complicated their day, and they're going to be mean to you. But the secret for French bureaucracy is have everything they ask for, have some things they didn't ask for, just in case. And be smiling and always be willing to say it's your fault. 
and you're going to get through. I own these people now. But it used to be that I was very afraid. I, I went in there, you know, shaking, like, I'm going to get deported from France, you know, tomorrow. And you don't realize they, they're not looking to deport you. They just want to verify everything's fine. And if you tell them that everything's fine, you show them everything's fine, you're going to get a stamp, stamp and leave the office, you know? So. Yeah, yeah. Just don't, just don't make their life more complicated. And I think there's a lot to be said there for like showing up over prepared. There is a tendency. I don't, I'm not going to say it's an American thing. It could be a, you know, from this could be a thing in a lot of the countries, but I just happen to know as an American and and the way that we approached our initial visa applications and in a few different countries, Spain being one of them, which sounds very, very similar, like a lot of the the processes and the things that they're looking for, the bureaucracy, it's, there's a lot of parallels there. Um, we were told the same thing, like just really over prepare. Like, so when we had to prove our income, for example, like yeah, we had the income letter that you that you mentioned before, like from my company saying, hey, this is how much I'm going to pay this guy while he's there, which the same thing as what you alluded to was weird because it was a non-lucrative visa where you're not technically supposed to be working, but the government knows exactly what you're doing. Now they're trying to push everyone to the digital nomad visa. It's like the exact same thing, but whatever. Um, but we also had, you know, credit card balances. Like this is how much I can access on a credit card if I need to. This is how much is in my... Uh, retirement funds and accounts and savings, like every single account, full detailed, way more than we needed to show. But we wanted to show every single thing. And and as you said, showed up to our interview and it was like, not an interview. It was a two second conversation where they flipped through the papers and said, thank you for making our life easy. Stamp and you're out. And, uh, and it really can, it, it can be so much less dramatic than we might want to, you know, make it seem in our minds sometimes. Right. And as you pointed out, with countries like Thailand, Croatia, Estonia, Portugal, smaller countries that don't have lots of other ways to make money, they they are able not only legislatively to move quickly, but they, they kind of need to do that. France doesn't need to encourage immigration. They've got plenty of people banging down the door who want to come. So they're not looking to say, well, how can we accelerate young people coming here? People are finding a way to come to France, whereas Croatia, these other places, they're trying to say, hey, I know you may not have thought about coming to Croatia, but let me make it easy for you. Same thing with Bulgaria, how how progressive they've been. I talked about Georgia. So those countries in, in which it's a bit, they're using that as an asset. Remember during COVID, I think Barbados came up with a digital nomad visa. So these countries, they have to be nimble in order to attract because now they know that these this entity exists these digital nomad people you know they wander the they wander the globe and they want to bring them in France and Spain there it's a lag time because they're they're busy working on other legislation for the country and they're not really thinking how can we attract more people to come here and so now as you say okay we're going to do this digital nomad thing we want to move everybody into that so we know that everybody lives in that space um, or with Portugal's adjustment with their golden visa. It's like, okay, we have too many people interested now. Uh, and the EU is breathing down our neck about it. So we've got to change our policy. So things change quickly in the visa world. <laughs> You've got to act quickly. Um, but, but if you're interested in coming to Europe, I want to encourage people that un don't get the impression that Chase and I did early on that it's difficult. It isn't. And there's way more help available for you now than there was for us 10 and seven years ago. And there's and there's more countries that are embracing it. They, they know that people like us exist and they want us to come and they're rewarding us. They're giving you tax holidays. I think the digital nomad visa in Croatia says specifically that you do not have to tax domicile in Croatia, which is nutty. I mean, the, they're even trying to attract people who are wary about where their tax domicile is. And they're saying, hey, you don't have to worry about that if you come to Croatia. And Croatia, for anyone who's been, it is absolutely gorgeous. It is absolutely gorgeous. It's the most expensive Balkan country, maybe with Slovenia, but it is uh, an absolute dream to, to, to be in any time of the year. Um, and, they, and, they, and they don't impose the same residence requirements that other places do. Yeah, for anyone listening who's particularly interested in the Croatian digital nomad visa, we did an episode on this with um, Jan de Jong, who's, who's one of the people behind creating it and working with the government to create it. And he shared some insights that was really fascinating, particularly about the battle between immigration and tax and how and the tax authorities and how they had to duke that out and eventually settled on, okay, fine, we won't tax them. 
um, which is the right move. Like in the in the long run, they're going to attract more people in, and they're going to reduce that friction um, through the digital nomad scheme. If people want to stay longer, then there's they need to create a path for that. But um, anyway, yeah, I, th- I think this is like this is very inspiring because I mean, there's no shortage of people out there who doesn't want to come spend some time in France, right? And like, there's to know that there's a few paths. Well, it's e- it, 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 <laughs> it's easy for me to say, and maybe for you. There's quite. It's interesting to to gauge Americans. Um, That's true. Yeah. Attitudes, right? So I was in I was in the iPhone. I was in the Apple store the other day. I had a problem with my iPhone and struck up a conversation with one of the techs, and he's like, "Oh man, I'd love to move to Ireland." And that you know, my usual questions come up: Do you like drinking? Do, are you okay with bad weather, uh, etc.? And I love Ireland. Uh, I have ancestral ties to Ireland, but it is particular, and I try to point out people it's not amazing weather and if you don't like drinking the drinking culture is an important part of that country and you should enjoy it and it's a wonderful you know live music it's all part of it and he said oh yeah man i'm all in on that i said okay well go Uh, by the way it's also one of the most expensive countries in europe to live in no one no one knows this it's one of these shadow shadow things but you'll find that Americans will have different reactions to different places. So people are like, oh, I want to go to Italy or I want to go to Germany or I want to go to France. And France is one of those particular ones, in part because people will immediately say, Stephen, I don't speak the language. And then I have to say, okay, because unlike other countries, and maybe you, you're the one, you're the Spain person, so I'm going to defer to you. But in Germany, in the Scandies, the Nordic countries, the, the low countries north of France, so uh, the Netherlands and Belgium, you can get away with not speaking that language. In France, you can only get away with that in Paris. If you go out to the other areas, Burgundy, uh, Bordeaux, uh, Nantes, uh, Lyon, you're going to need to speak at least some French to, to get around. And I get that people are intimidated. For me, French is beautiful and not that difficult because I had a Latin and Spanish background. But uh, for other people, they're like, no, I just want to go somewhere. Or Americans are likely to speak some kind of Spanish. So maybe Spain is more uh, more appealing to them. But the language barrier is the immediate objection. And then people go, yeah, and then the French, you know, they're just so rude. And then, and, and then you, you say, I don't know what to tell you. I've lived with them. If you think I could just live with rude people for 10 years. And, and it's a classic uh, issue of judging America by New York City. Would you say, well, because I've been to New York City, I know how Americans are. Oh, no. Right. So because you've been to Paris, you know how French people are. So Paris is a city like any other city. If you go to London, Chicago, New York, people are on the move. They're in a rush. They're they're not necessarily, hey, let's let's start and have a conversation. And, and that's the same in any country. So it's not fair to put that on the Parisians, that they're the sole representatives of city culture in the world. It's like that in many other cities. But uh, the other the other part of French life is, as you say, it is. I think the closest American analog would be California. So California, you've got a Spanish speaking country to the south. You have uh, an English speaking country nearby. You've got mountains. You've got um, cheese. You've got wine. You've got a, a wonderful, wonderful culture. California is amazing and it's very expensive to live there. The thing is, France is not expensive to live in at all. I, I tell people all the time, if you live on the minimum wage, you can have your own apartment in Paris which is nuts, right? If you think about that, okay, 1400 euros. So let me break it down. Your biggest, your biggest expense is going to be your apartment. Now, the game of apartment getting in Paris is special. Like I'm sure it is the way in Hong Kong, San Francisco, New York, any place where there's no new construction and a limited inventory, it's going to be a challenge. The way you normally get an apartment in Paris is you put out a call on your friend's network and then the answer comes back and then you get the apartment before it ever goes out, right? That's, and that's, that's how it works. But if you don't know anyone and you have no friends, then you get to pay the tourist tax, which is what I did. My first apartment in Paris was 64 square feet, so six square meters, which is illegal, right? That's not a legal rental. And it was 800 euros a month, okay? And it was on the eighth floor of a, an apartment with no elevator. Um, and so that's the, that's the I don't know anybody tax, right? And, and that's just how it is. And those And I look back now, I laugh, you know, with some of my friends, we did the same thing. I just thought I must have really wanted to live in Paris for me to to, to live in a situation like that. But I, I did. I, I really did. And so if you pay, so let's say that's 800 euros a month. That's the most. I would later get uh, something similar, bigger in the 11th, 
that was like seven fifty a month. So you can get a studio or what is called a studette, like a student studio, for about seven hundred fifty eight hundred euros a month. That is still valid, okay? Now you can get an all zones Navigo pass that that takes you to the, both airports, Versailles, everywhere you want to go. Even if you want to go to Disneyland, I've never been to Disneyland. Ten years in France. Um, that's eighty three euros a month. You can have the phone plan I have from free, which is 20 euros a month, gives me unlimited data in France, unlimited calling in, in France and Europe. And when I travel to other countries, I get 25 gigs. I'm in, I'm in the United States right now. I have 25 gigs from my French carrier. And it's the same in Israel. It's the same in Canada, Mexico, a bunch of other countries. I'm paying 20 euros a month for that plan. If you have an internet box, it's five euros cheaper even. So apart from that now, how often do you eat out? Okay, add that up. Uh, if you eat out once a week, and let's say you're spending 30 or 40 euros eating out, you're still you still not going to eat up your minimum wage. So tell me how you get to 1400, 1500. Now, if you want to discretionarily travel to Berlin on the weekends or to Ibiza, okay, fine. But you can't tell me that's part of your normal way of living, right? So uh, groceries, that's the same in any country. So let's say I spend $100 a week on groceries for myself, 400. I still am not going to eat up all of that. So the fact that you can live in Paris on the minimum wage, and I've done it by experiment, and I've documented it in old blog posts, underlines to me that that nagging thing that Paris is this really expensive place. It is if you want to buy property, it is. It's a closed system where there's no new construction, and it's prestigious, and everybody wants to own property in Paris. I get that. But if you don't want to get on the property ladder, and you, you do what a lot of young French people do, which is they buy property outside of Paris... So they get on the property ladder that way, and then they just rent the place. And now, after COVID, things have completely transformed. A lot of the young French who are living in Paris for the jobs, now that they're allowed to remote work, which you have to realize what a mind-blowing thing it is for the French to allow remote work. Like, it was a science fiction story. Remote work was a science fiction story prior to March 2020 in France. And now, a lot of the French workforce has normalized even... The French bureaucracy has moved a lot of functions online. You can submit citizenship application online now, which which if you told me that a few years ago, that you'd be allowed to submit when part of the ritual of getting French citizenship was you had to go to your appointment. They would gloomily look through everything. And if you were missing one thing, they'd send you back to start the process all over. And getting that appointment was so hard anyway. And now it's all online because of COVID. So what that has done to people's living habits is I don't have to come to the capital anymore to have this job. Well, that means I can live in Nantes or I can live in Lyon. And if I want to go to the capital, then I can just take a two hour train or a one hour train. I lived, I tried this experiment myself for different reasons. I moved to a small town 45 minutes south of Paris by train called moray sur loin absolutely gorgeous, on a river next to the Fontainebleau forest. I was paying 40% the rent that I was paying in Paris. And, every, every, you know, it's a classic small town. You go to the grocery store, they want to have a conversation with you. You go to the post office, they want to have a conversation with you. My dry cleaning lady, where'd you go last week? I want to talk to you about it. So she would like travel vicariously through me. And and I could just take my electric bike, which, by the way, was 70% subsidized by the French government. I could take it to the train station, hang it on a hook and come into the capital 45 minutes later, unhook my bicycle. And then I'm in one of the most bike friendly cities in the world right now, that was another thing that transformed during COVID was the mayor went all out, turned a bunch of um, streets into bike lanes. And if you want to, you can live outside uh, of Paris. You, I, I, I guess I'm a Paris file. Yes, I'm going to go on all day about how it's the, it's the most beautiful city in the world. My favorite city. Yes. But even if you're not a Paris person, there are many wonderful places you can live in France. It's so well connected with bus transit. Do you know, uh, I, Chase, I'm always surprised people don't know about blah blah car. Do they have that in Spain as well? They do. Yeah, yeah. We we yeah. use it in Spain. How did America <laughs> not come up with this? People How is it scared. that the Europeans came up with blah blah car? People are scared. I think people are ter- there. There. There's a a safety net in Europe that we don't feel so cl- closely connected to. When I mention blah blah car to friends, family back in the US, the reaction that I get is like, you would trust like riding in a car with someone else, and it's like. It, it could it could be a generational thing that we we trust reviews like we grew up buying on eBay so it's like well the reviews and it's like famous last words his reviews were good you know you end up murdered on the side of the road that's like all right well I thought his reviews were good like famous last words but the, the 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 idea that that would happen as you say for those of us who live here that 
that wouldn't occur to us. But I get that that's the attitude. Uh, maybe maybe people wouldn't feel as safe in America and they would articulate that. I, I get that. Well, I, and I, I think that. also like it's a very, I guess, like in the US, we're very car centric. Like everybody's got it. Like you just you have to have a car. If, right. Why would you need why would you need blah, blah, car as a service? And for yeah. those listening who don't know what we're talking about, it's a ride sharing app that just makes it's like long distance Uber. Airbnb for. Yeah. And you can just yeah, like long distance Uber. You ride with someone else and you can pay like. I've, I've paid like five euros to, to do like a hour and a half car ride to an airport or something like that. I mean, it's, it can be incredibly inexpensive. Um, and one of the re- many reasons why And you can why select you options, car. pet, no pet, music, no music, talking, no talking. And you can see people's ratings and, and pick what makes the most sense for you. I, I, I think it's absolutely brilliant. But it just shows you Europe just has this unbelievable uh, volume of choice. Like I can take a budget airline flight. I could take a train. I could take a bus. There's an overnight bus from London to Paris. That's like nine euros, right? I'm too old for that. I'm too old for that kind of travel anymore, but you could, you could do that. You could do a blah, blah car. There's just so many options, but we don't have any of those options in America, right? I'm visiting my family now and I'm engineering a trip uh, for my brothers-in-law and my nephews for them to understand what it's like to live without a car. So we're going to take the train from Kansas City to St. Louis. And then when we're in St. Louis, we're not going to have a car. We're going to take the bus and the, the tram around. And I want them to see it, not because they're going to convert to that life because they live in a part of the country that doesn't allow for that. But I want them to see, okay, you go buy your groceries, you walk them home. And the exercise that you get just from existing without a car, it's such a great dividend. When I come to America, I always have to keep in mind, one, I... I give myself some guilty pleasures. I'll go to Waffle House. I'll go to Dunkin' Donuts. The other part is I don't have to exercise as much. So I have to do extra crazy things. Like if I go to a store, I have to park at the edge of the parking lot and manufacture walking. You know, I have to create opportunities for myself to walk because you you can't blame Americans. Their infrastructure doesn't allow for them to exercise. So you have to artificially create those choices. Chances otherwise, you will do what I do, which is when I come to America, I usually gain two pounds a week until I go back to Europe and then it all goes away. Same, same happens to me. I always come back like it's, it's actually, I never thought about it the per week thing, but it's, it's right around the same, uh, the same number there. And it's, um, it's always very frustrating. And one of the things that I've come to realize now is that like, I can never go back to not being in a walkable, bikeable place like that's So actually, as we record right now, my wife and I are uh, doing like a small stint down in the Greek islands, um, which sounds amazing. And it is, I'm not like complaining about it. But one of the things that we've realized is like where we are, it's not, it's a city, but it's not very like walkable, bikeable. You drive everywhere. Like it's, there's no bike lanes. Um, the sidewalks are almost like non-existent. Actually, it's really funny. They've like planted trees right in the low trees, right in the middle of all the very small sidewalks. So you, you legitimately can't walk down them. You have to like duck. And, I, and I'm not like extremely tall. I'm talking about like, you have to completely bend over to get under them. Um, and so it's just funny. It's like the infrastructure is so different and I've gotten so accustomed to these like other Southern or central European cities where everything's set up to be very walkable, very bikeable. And it's something I can't live without anymore. Like it's, I, I love that convenience of not having to drive. Um, some people might listen to that and say like, I love driving. I, you know, I want to, I want to get in my car and drive two minutes to the grocery store. Um, but my, my mentality on that has shifted completely and I feel like I can't go back now. Yeah. And I, and I get that other people, it's not for them, but I would argue, why don't you give it a try and find out if it's not for you? And the other, the other part is, even though I haven't owned a car for 10 years now, I always, I can rent a car anytime. I, I may be a little uncertain behind the wheel the first couple seconds. Cause you know, I, it's not a habit for me anymore. It's okay. You to drive it. And I was driving an electric car. This, and I was telling you, Chase, before we started recording, like, I'm not ready for the future. I had to look up on, on Google how to turn off this car. Uh, cause you have to, you have to go to a menu and then you have to scroll down and then you have to click power off. Like I, I'm not quite ready for the electric car future. But the point is, if I want a car, cause I want to go down to wine country with my friends and you don't do that by train and bus, you do that in a car. Uh, I can rent a car anytime I want. If you, if you want to enjoy the joy of driving, if you want to take the car on the Autobahn, you can rent a car. And now you don't have to have a car sitting that you pay for and the insurance and the oil changes or uh, battery changes if you have an electric car, whatever it might be, you don't have to pay for all of that because I'm paying all of 80 euros a month to get all the transportation I need, which 
which is crazy. I mean, that's a substantial portion of most Americans' budget is the car payment, insurance, um, what it takes to maintain the car, what it takes to keep the car clean, what it takes to title and license the car in the state that you live in. And imagining that that all goes away in exchange for a pass, and then you occasionally need to rent a car. That should be like fantasy fulfillment, I would think, for most people. Like, look, give it a try. See, if you hate it, you can always go back. I think that's the attitude, too. It's like, well, I don't know if I'd like Europe, Stephen. Well, why don't you try? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and if, if you I always say, like, if you have if you have that itch, you owe it to yourself to scratch it. Like, you just got to give it a shot. And the worst case scenario is you'll end up right back where you were, uh, you know, six months or a year later. I, I, I always think, like, you should give it a real shot. Some I've met some people who have come abroad for a month, you know, two months, and they're like, okay, um, this isn't for me. But I, I think it takes... It, like I've actually come to think, I used to think it was more like three or six months, but I feel like it almost takes like a full year to like really integrate on some. I would, real I level. would agree with you. Yeah, you go to see all the seasons, you get to see all the holidays, and and we always say worst case scenario, you'll go back, but worst case, you're going to go back with new friends, new ways of looking at things, new experiences, maybe a, a higher level of a new language. You're going to go back so rich in many ways. So, and I applaud those people because even if you went, you find out it wasn't for you and you went back, you've entered a very small echelon of people who tried as opposed to the, oh, someday that might be nice to live in Chile or, oh, you know, I've always wanted to live in Italy. You say, well, what have you done about that? Oh, nothing. So you, they, those people who went for a year and decided it wasn't for them, I applaud that because at least they went through the work. They tried it and they found out it wasn't for them. A lot of times I find people say they miss their family a lot and there's no way to cure that. So if you miss your family, you're very attached to them. Hey, you got to go uh, or you got to move into Italy, <laughs> whatever, whatever it might be. But but I, I get that that's a non non fixable entity. But there are so many options that this life offers to us. And as you say, you're in Spain, but now you're you're which which island are you in? in Greece? Uh, I'm in Crete right now. OK, yeah. so how big is how big is Crete? Uh, that's a great question. Um, I don't know if I have comparatively. Like a comparative there's there's a there's a really great app called map fight map so if you fight. if you go in if you go into map fight i think mapfight.xyz and you type in wherever you are you can compare it. and it's fun it's even like historical things like you can type in holy roman empire <laughs> and then you can see like how it compares to where you are but if you look up crete then you can see like what it's close to size wise oh this is super cool i'm doing it as we speak here um <laughs> Oh, the first one I see, I just randomly scrolled down. It's it's legitimately, this is so cool. People should check this out. You can like do, a, it shows like all the map overlays so you can see how big it is. So it's, Ireland is 10 times as big as Crete, but like the distance east to west uh, is almost exactly the same. The one thing I know is from the two biggest cities, which like Heroclean is on the far, what would that be? East side and Hania is on the far west side. They're like the two major cities. It's a three hour drive between them. It looks much shorter, but it's in, and like, that's the other thing is like the roads and infrastructure are different. So, um, but it's the biggest Greek Island. And like, there's literally, I mean, you're this, this Island sitting here right next to Africa, Turkey, uh, Southern, like Southern Italy. Like when you look at it on a map, like that's what you see. And, um, but there's snow capped peaks on the mountains, uh, of course, beautiful beaches, lively cities, um, a lot of diversity here, which is why, like, we decided to post up here for a little bit. That that's awesome. And you're you're in a part of the world I was in recently. I I've been doing a lot of travel. And last year, I'm working on a book about borders, and I've been going to difficult border spots. So around your area, Cyprus, which I'm sure you know, is divided between the Turkish side and a Greek side. Um, Kosovo, which is in the Balkans. I was in Israel. I went down to Gaza. I was in Jordan talking with some Palestinian people. So you're close. You're really close to all those places. And they're some of the more special places I visited in my life. But Crete was one of those ones I missed. There was just, there's only so much you can do, right? Like there's a finite number of, there's a finite number of days you've got, you still have to work, you know, you still have to pay the bills. And, uh, but you're in a great position to get to all those places. Also, a little further, closer to Europe, but I would still recommend it to you if you haven't already been. I think you might have if you were in Spain. Is Tunisia? I got to go there at the end of last year, and I absolutely love it. Friendly people, um, and 
gorgeous. Oh, so. great suggestion. Yeah, there's so, I mean, this is the thing, right? Like the more, I'm sure you have plenty of people, um, that sounds like a fascinating book, by the way. Uh, so I'm very interested to hear more about that. But there's, um, the more you see, like pe- people will tell you, oh man, you've seen so much, Stephen. And, and I'll bet like me, you feel like, yeah, the more you see, the more you realize you haven't seen. Um, because like you just got done spending time down in this part of the world, but you missed Crete. So, oh, now you got to get to Crete. I just heard about Tun- Tunisia. I'm like, oh man, now I got to get to Tunisia. Um, and so like, there, there's a, there's a philosophical formulation for that as the island of my knowledge grows. So does the shore of my ignorance. Oh man, that, okay. So that's way more eloquent than what I said. Uh, remember that one. <laughs> um, I, I love that, but it is so true. And it's, uh, and it's a bit frustrating in a way because you think, there's like, it's, it's frustrating in a fun way because it's like, I kind of liken it to playing golf. If anybody's played golf, it's like the first time you play golf, you're going to like swing and hit 120 and you're going to be terrible. Um, and then the next time you're going to hit 110 and you're going to think you're a lot better. And then the next time you're going to hit 108 and you're, but it's going to just continuously be frustrating because you're never going to get to be like really good. Like you'll continuously get a little bit better, but you're just going to realize you wish you were better as you went along. And that's how it is for me with this, this like travel thing. I'm like, the more I see, the more I'm like, Oh, now I got to go see more of this place, you know? And, and it just never, it it never goes away. Well, it's funny you mentioned golf because I realized that the shortcut there is if you're already a high performance athlete, like I watched Steph Curry make a hole in one the other day. Right. So it's like, Oh, so, and, and Tom Brady's made one too. So it's like, okay, so all I have to do is be an MVP and win the championship of whatever sport I am. And then I've got a shortcut into golf, right? The rest of us poor schmoes have to go through the process that Chase has outlined, but there must be something about high performance athletes and the way that they can focus on a set of tasks and follow what they're told to do that can lead them to, you know, in their hobby, their off time, they also can still get holes in one. Yeah. yeah. We hate these the people. Rest, the rest of us uh, are just <laughs> inadequate. <laughs> in, a, in a funny parallel there, that is essentially what I, I thought I had to be the high performance athlete in order to ever have the chance of moving to France before talking to you. So I, uh, I thought it was like a, you know, you had to win the lottery kind of thing. I mean, there was just, there was never any information out there. And, and so like hearing about this has been, um, very, very helpful for me. I know a lot of people, I've had people literally ask me, yeah, but what about France? And and you're right. It is a particular, you, you, you raised a good flag there. Like it is a particular place for various reasons. I have come to love it because I love passing through there and I've spent some time, I have a camper van. And so camp, it's like, I call it camper van paradise. Uh, France is the best country in Europe to camper van in. It's, they, they've just got all the facilities in place. Um, it's all top notch. Like you'll, you'll never miss anything, uh, doing a camper van experience in, in France. Um, but that's, you know, that's been my experience. I've come to love it. So I forget that there are a lot of people who, um, who, who may not resonate with it right away, but I think it's a fascinating place to, to go spend some time. For sure. And, and, and you alluded to some of it, you know, there's Spanish speaking mountains, there's German speaking mountains, there's Italian speaking mountains, there's every type of cheese you can imagine the, the, there's arguments about which wine regions are better within France. And, and I think what's fascinating about always having been the foreigner is you, if you're a foreigner and you, you move, whether it's an American or anyone else, you're the one who didn't grow up with this. So you don't take anything for granted. So here are the biases I come in with. Okay. French people know everything about food. French people know everything about cheese. French people know everything about wine. So you're always intimidated, but then you dig in and you're like, I'm going to learn about French wine. I'm going to taste French wine. I'm going to learn about French cheese. And then one day you find yourself like telling your French friends about something they've never heard about in their life. And they've lived there their whole lives. And then they look at you and say, it's deceiving. And now these people have been to the Grand Canyon. They've been to New Zealand. They've been to all these other places, but they haven't explored their own country. It's the curse of the local that if it's in your backyard, you're like, you're saying, you say, I'll always go there or I go when visitors come. But because you're the foreigner, oh, it's all new to you. And you always ask why and you want to dig deep and, and learn all these things. And so I've really, in my last 10 years, had a chance to see so much of the country, not only because there's so many things that if you're a history buff, there are intact Roman ruins in this, in this country, aqueducts, theaters, more complete than in Italy on the level of what you, you also find this in Croatia, complete temples that are, that, that are still usable. Um, World War II, World War I. If you're interested in, in history, you can go there and, and, and it's, it's tough. I always tell people I've, 
been to Omaha Beach five times now, and every time I go, I think it's going to be easier, and every time it gets more difficult. To, to, to be on that beach, to see all of those white crosses, knowing the average age is 23, 22, um, it's humbling, and it will remind you, like, hey, you're out here um, taking this in, you know, be worthy of that, you know, when you see that. Uh, and then you've got uh, all of these uh, towns that have their own types of food and their treats and, and, and the people. And it's like that in Germany. It's like that in Spain as well. So I don't want to pretend that France has a monopoly on that. There are charming towns, particularly in the south of, of Spain, Arcos, all of those, you know, small towns. They have that same charm and the same sort of people who are very proud of where they are. And maybe that might turn Americans off that we are so mobile and we don't have loyalty to wherever we always just, oh, well, I'll move for a work or I'll move for a job or I'll move for a school. I move for a girl. And in Europe, that's a real question. Like, hmm, am I going to move for that? Hmm, I don't think I'm going to leave my family. I'm not going to leave my region. That's just, they've been around for thousands of years. So they don't think about mobility in the same way that we do. So then that gets interpreted to Americans as arrogance or proud or, oh, you know, the, they're really proud. I'm like, Gosh, I don't know why they would be proud of a place where their families lived for a thousand years and they still speak the same language that their their ancestors did and they still have the same wonderful street fairs. I've been to a running of the bulls in the south of, of France and they've been doing that for like hundreds of years. Like I can't imagine or you're watching people swim in an aqueduct that's been there since the Roman, you know, in a lake in front of an aqueduct that's been there since the Roman era. And you think, gosh, I wonder why these people are proud of where they live. What a shocker. I can't imagine that they're proud of where they live and they think that it's a pretty great place. I, I, I don't know. It's so funny you mentioned the aqueduct. Um, like, so last year, my my wife and I took the the van up from um, Spain and drove into France, and we ended up near the Pont du Gard. And it was we were camping right by there, and it was our first time um, in this part of of France, and it had been a while since we'd been out of Spain, and we just like walked from the place where we were camping like five minutes away on the Pont de Gare. There was a, like a projection playing of like beautiful art and water, like this whole show taking place, wine and food, uh, wine and cheese festival happening, food trucks, uh, very like pleasant music playing in the background, the river running by. And we were like, have we arrived in like a heaven? Like this is, this is like, like I love Spain. I've, I've loved living in Spain, but Spain is much more like chaotic. And, and we were like, if this was happening in Spain, it would be like a fiesta. You know, this was like just this like beautiful scene unfolding in front of us. And we were like, I think France is like the most pleasant place in the world. <laughs> like we felt we felt so, so uh, comfortable there. And anyway, it was just like a, you know, just a moment where we were just crossed into France. And like that was our experience. And um yeah, it's a it's, a well, it's so place. nice to hear you tell that story because the media wants to tell you that France is like burning trash cans. And that's what happens when you take the cameras, you bring it to Paris, you bring it to a particular. But I can show you where in Paris they're going to bring the cameras. And then that's that's it. Like France is burning like France is over. And you're, you're like, I don't you, you people don't even I remember when there were no go zones talked about in 2015. My street was a no go zone. And I like I, I told my parents who watched some of this propaganda, unfortunately, at the time. I took a picture. I said, does this look like a no-go zone to you? <laughs> you know? Um, and so life in France is really sweet and beautiful, it, it, the, not only in the way that Chase described, but just in the morning rituals of, you know, going to get your bread every day and having conversations with the, the cheese lady who was going to ask how your cheese party went last time with the suggestions that she made. Or even uh, in the way that they hold on to their traditions. I remember a friend who was ordering duck and he said, well, I want to cook to a certain temperature. I said, oh, no, in France, you don't tell duck is cooked to temperature, as the chef says. And she, and, and she goes, well, I'm going to ask anyway. I said, OK. So she, you know, hi, could I, can I change? And I'm going to do the American voice. I'd like to change my uh, temperature of duck. And, and the waiter looks at her and he says, no. <laughs> and he, he walks off. <laughs> or they ask for something. Can I have peas instead of carrots? No. Right. It wouldn't occur to them in part because they think the chef is a trained professional. You're an amateur. He this is what he gave to you. And the same thing. Salt and pepper is not on the table unless you ask for it, generally speaking. Right. Because the idea is he wanted to season it right for you. That's his job. He wants to give it to you ready. 
and how France has totally modified my cooking habits. I grew up in Singapore and with uh, with a Chinese background of cooking. So in in Chinese cooking, we're always trying to transform something. So we're going to take pork and we're going to make it sweet and sour and spicy, and it's going to have it's going to have bells and whistles. It's going to talk to you. And in France, it's about the most chickeny chicken, the most beefy beef. And so there is a lack of there's no spice rack. That's maybe salt, pepper, maybe some lemon, maybe an herb. But they want to just r- bring this flavor out. And part of that is GMOs illegal, right? They they just want to take this. And my I didn't realize until like three or four years in. But I realized as I don't use my spices. What did the French do to me? And when you're around and you're in a culture immersed, you just start thinking the way that they do, and you start eating the way that they do, and talking the way they do, and they change the way that I cooked. And it's like, oh, my mother would be like unhappy about this because I was taught, you know, you use this. So it became this hybrid where I would consciously use some Chinese ingredients with French techniques to bring out these different flavors. And then my my friends are like, wow, this is really interesting. I've never had something like this before. Um, because the proteins are different, you know, French chicken really is wonderful, uh, and, and it, it tastes different uh, in part because it's raised different. The the breeds are different. I was in Jersey and Guernsey visiting friends recently. Jersey cows are not allowed to leave Jersey. Right? They're very protective, and it's illegal to bring in other cows or milk into Jersey. So it, there is something we don't know that in America because everything's we're such a big country and there's, there's so many different ways that you can get it. But when you can taste butter or cream or or milk or yogurt from a particular region, you're like, Oh wow, it has this particular taste or, okay, so this is sheep's and this is goat's yogurt. And um, there's such a joy when people say, what do you talk about in France? I'm like food. We talk about food all the time. We talk about food while we're eating food, right? We'll talk about another meal that we had some time ago. The Sing- Singaporeans do this too, to be fair. But there is just a, a a real joy for life, and I suppose I'll just I know I don't I don't want to run too long, Chase, but I think the way I would close talking about France is a pan European attitude, which is in France we have a notion that we have life that exists primarily, and work is a way that you can choose to power that life. You don't have to. You can maybe buy real estate or you can do other things, but the primary question is, am I happy living the life that I'm living, and that you are in control of that? Europeans believe this as an idea. In America, we hustle and we work so hard for so long that that question never occurs to us because we're too tired when we get home from work to think about bigger things. So we don't we don't give ourselves the time and space in America, not to say that we're not intelligent enough to have those questions, but we don't have time. We're tired. We come back, flop in our bed. A lot of these people do, you know, Netflix and, and Uber Eats. And that's all that's all they can do to make it to the weekend. And in Europe, it's five o'clock. Or if you're in Norway, four o'clock, right? That's it. You know, they're going to, they're going to go hang out with their friends and work has its limits. And, and that's a pan European thing. So that's a general encouragement to come to Europe, but particularly in France, they really love life. They've got a real sense of how to live it well. And if you want to come as an American, as I did, and learn from the best uh, about how to how to live life better, I, I think there are worse places you could go to than France. Uh, I would agree. And if anybody came into this with uh, with a notion of disagreeing with you on that, but they just wanted to hear the other side of the coin, I bet I bet some. Uh, opinions have been turned <laughs> because you've sold it well, man. I, uh, no, it's, it, it does just seem like you're living an amazing life, very balanced, enjoying what you're doing um, and helping a lot of people fulfill their dreams to, to come kind of follow in your footsteps. So um, yeah, this has been fascinating. I could, I could drill you with a thousand more questions to be honest, but I know I've already kept you longer than I said I would. So I would, um, I would love to just make sure that everybody has access to contact you if they're interested in chatting more, learning more about some of the things you've written. So where can people follow along? And um, and we'll put these links and any handles that you mentioned in the show notes as well. So I, I feel bad for any other Stephen Heiners because I've taken over all the socials, right? So like every social, I have the at Stephen Heiner. And I've run into some of them on LinkedIn, right? Like I'll send messages like, hey, you know, name, name, name double. And, uh, but I've taken over all of the socials. So I do book reviews. You'll find that on YouTube at Steven Heiner. Um, take lots of photos. You'll find that on Instagram. If you want to chat with me on Twitter, the AKA formerly Twitter, now called X, whatever it's going to be in the future. Uh, Facebook, you can find me there. 
<laughs> right? If you want to, if you want to follow me there. So all, all the socials, you're going to find that at Stephen Heiner, that's Stephen with a PH and Heiner, Heiner is H-E-I-N-E-R. Uh, and that's a fun anecdote, Chase, that I'm, I'm half, Chi- half Chinese on my mother's side and with a, a name that sounds very German, Heiner is like Smith in, in Germany. So when I go there, I see my name everywhere, like bakeries, whatever. And if I if I go to a hostel and I turn over my passport, they, they look down at the passport, they look back up at me, and then they look back down at the passport, like, is, is this right? Is, is there a mistake here? This this does this guy have this last name? Um, if you want to uh, read my writings on Medium, it's you'll also find it under at Stephen Heiner. But if you want to get real specific about France, you can find the American in Paris dot com. I write that with a few other people, and. Um, the life you want.io has those video courses that um, will help with with specific visa classifications. But I've also got some fun other visa, uh, some other courses on there, like being an Airbnb super host or or running a meetup group. Just some just some fun stuff uh, that I thought, well, as long as I'm doing a video course for this, I might as well do a video course for that. And uh, you can you can find me on there, and I'd I'd love to connect. Uh, however, any and answer any questions I might have for people who are thinking about making this big change in their life. Yeah, that's amazing. Thank you. I mean, I I always say this, um, but like I'm a huge fan of of outsourcing what we're not great at, and and people, if you you know if you think you're great at immigration stuff uh, when you're navigating it for the first time. Uh, I promise you, you're not. So uh, I always recommend just talk to someone that's done it before, um, you know, at least pick somebody's brain. I always suggest hiring somebody to walk you through the process. Um, but I, I, you've got a great resource here in Steven. So if France is on your mind at all, um, I would, you know, definitely reach out. Uh, this has been super informative. One of the more informative episodes we've done in a really long time. So um, I'm so glad we we finally were able to make it happen. And um, I hope we can cross paths in France. I would, uh, I haven't been back to Paris in a long time. And it would be really cool to meet up and uh, see it through a local's eyes. So oh, uh, 100%. <laughs> I'd, love to sh- I'd love to show you around. There's a lot of wonderful things to see. And I think that's something else too about Paris that maybe can be tough for people because you, it, there's so many people there, right? And there it's the, I think the most visited city in the world, and it can be challenging to to be pulled in, oh, I've got to see the Eiffel Tower, I've got to see the Louvre, I've got to, but there's so many other really wonderful things uh, to, to see and check out. And as Chase said, always ask a local, we, we know all the good stuff. Oh, yeah, that's fantastic. Well, I will take you up on that offer. And uh, I hope some listeners will as well. Also, thanks for introducing me to map fight. That might be a new, uh, a new favorite here. A new obsession. I mean, yeah, it's going <laughs> to might detract from my productivity, but uh, nonetheless, <laughs> uh, thank you, Stephen. This has been awesome, and uh, I hope I hope we'll get to catch up again soon. All right, man. Thanks so much. Thanks for tuning in today from wherever you are in the world. Once again, I'm Chase, and this has been another episode of About Abroad. For those of you wondering how you can best support the show, I have made it super simple for you. Just go over to the show notes of the episode that you just finished listening to and click on one of the two following links. Aboutabroad.com slash newsletter to get our monthly newsletter. No spam, guaranteed. Or ratethispodcast.com slash aboutabroad where you can quickly and easily leave a review for the show. It's not just important to me. It also helps more wanderers just like you find us. Finally, don't forget to subscribe on your podcast platform of choice. And we will see you again next week. Thanks again. Hasta luego, amigos.